Hello everybody and welcome back to your q and clients, it's Twin Kel here, coming back to you with another Shadowverse Evolve video. This time we're going to be talking about Young Ugger Gang, Booster Set Kang, Gosuke Arcana, the second anniversary set for the Japanese game. So we're going to go ahead and roll the intro and get right into it. <laughs> So welcome back. This is going to be a hopefully as quick of a breakdown as possible with the large release that is Booster Set Kang, Ghost of the Arcana, which is primarily based off of the digital games Fortune's Handset, one of my personal favorites from that time. The Arcana game was very neat and the mega game and the digital game was very much geared more towards mid-range and control. Yes, it kind of shut down aggro for a while, but it's kind of like we went back to BP-01 Advent of Genesis in a way, right? But hopefully that's no longer the case with how many new cards the game has received since then. So we're going to go ahead and have my little handy uh, note sheet there because there is a lot of information to process. So let's go ahead and break it down class by class, card by card, Give some quick thoughts and we'll go into it. So first of all, we have number 12, Wolfrog Hang Man. You actually hear his voice in the trailer for Fortune's Hang in the digital game. Whoa. <sighs> so much for being down to earth. But that being said, he does, I feel he enables more of this control strategy by him being able to be, he's first of all, he's invulnerable to effect damage as well as invulnerable to being destroyed by effects so that's pretty handy despite him being a little tiny as a like a 2-3 or whatever or 2-2 two, two. and he gets you know five play points to grab the treacherous reversal spell into your ex area reduce its cost from eight to zero for that turn which will then do a complete board reset and fill up your ex area so that is pretty handy and treacherous reversal as a card could also go Pretty decent with say the Idrisil from BP09 Duet of Light and Shadow. So that might be another synergy that we can continue you know, kind of going more into enabling a control strategy in Forcecraft. And he can also evolve for one. Moving along, we do have Lucille, Keeper of Relics, who then gives access to the artifact token. So ancient artifact, mystic artifact, etc. And on top of that, under the right conditions, as in you meet. Having exactly 5 cards in EX area, they're all different costs. You can then effectively transform her into Spinaria and Lucille Keepers. And as you see, this, this is an advanced card, so this is a new type of card that Ghost of Yarkana introduced to be another form of card that goes in your Evolve deck. As you see, these actually have a real cost on them. So the idea is that they can be played from EX area, should they be should they end up there and you pay the actual cost to play them down. But that being said, with Spinaria and Lucille Keepers, they can do, on Fanfare, they do 6 AoE damage to the enemy board, and they can put additional cards to the EX area on top of that, and at the end of the turn, they you can choose to refresh it because they have the ability of when the opponent puts a forward down, you can engage Spinaria and Lucille Keepers to deal 6 damage to you know, Again, this is kind of more of a slower control based strategy. I could see this unironically going well with, say, the Fable cards from all the way back in Booster Set 3, Flame of Mig, I mean Levitang, because you are already kind of playing to slow down the opponent with all your cards from that time to be able to lead up into Beauty and the Beast, lead those swings, and so on. Now we move on from there to Chipper Skipper. This benefits a little more from playing mercenary type forwards. I'll see if I can like have a little list or something. Or just kind of like flash a bunch of mercenary followers on the screen here. And this can also grab a cost two or more forward from top four and make it free for return upon evolving for one. So that's pretty nice. Then we also have Wing Flower Tiger, who could bounce a fellow beast forward with a different name than herself to tutor for a Salvia Panther that can go in your hand. And that could you could play it for one instead of her original three if you have bounced a different name to be forward return, which again, Wayne Flower Tiger is meant to enable that. 
Then with Slavia Panther, you can already have Storm as it is. And she, she can also evolve for two to bounce a cost three or lower enemy forward. So I could say bounce a ward or something in the way and just pave yourself in for that easy storm damage. Beast aggro could be a thing as say our man from way back, or from not way back, but from back in Bush's Set 9, Duet of Light and Shadow. Then we have Optimistic Beastmaster who could help set up that ES area for the likes of Lucio Keeper of Relics. And because he could put a card from top to the EX area. And he can also do, he can also engage himself to deal damage to an enemy follower based on the number of cards with different costs in your EX area. So it says up to five. Thank you, Shabby, for the cost the guy is. And then we have a very weird card in Lumbering Carapace. Guys, a one drop with Rush and a combo three. Can also add another copy of himself. So this could go in like some funky, weird combo decks if you really do it right. But I think it doesn't add enough to the combo strategy in general by the time we've reached this part of the carpool. We also have Recursive Ponderer, who could trigger for any Arcana trait card to your EX area. And he can evolve for one to do this another, also another card that can enable Lucille, keepers, uh, Keeper of Relic. And then we have Crocus Rack. I believe these cards are only in, only been shown in the anime, so we're going to see a lot of these cards that were only in the Shadow vs. Flame anime that have yet to make it to the digital game as the time of this recording. If anything, they probably end up in the Ultimate Wars Beyond, but that's a story for another time. This guy heals upon being returned to your hand, and the guy can also fanfare paying additional 5 play points on top of his casting costs to bottom deck an enemy follower and draw a card. God starts out as being a 1 cost 2 too, so you got that beautiful goblin stat, right? As we're going to say, give you a blossoming archer who can deal 3 damage to an enemy forward if there are 3 or more cards with different costs in your EX area. Again, this is also a goblin stat type card. That's not too bad. Then we have Deep Wood Wolf. This comes in as a 7 cost 4 for Storm, and it just gets plus 2 plus 2 each time another beast comes down. So you could again combo with Owl Man from BP09, Duet of Light and Shadow to give that guy 7-7 seven, seven as a Storm for just 8 play points. That's kind of insanity. But in your hand, you can also use him as a pseudo spell. You pay one, discard, or put him in the EX area. So it's not even like a true spell to choose one of your own cards and put it to your EX area. So again, this, this can also help enable, say, you see a Keeper of Relics, or you, you say, you know, you're playing Fable, Building a Beast has already done their thing, but you also want to go, I don't want this to be vulnerable for, to, to my opponent's swing in or something. You can go ahead and bounce it back in, wrecking the shenanigans again on a, a subsequent turn while stacking up more Fable counters via all the Fable counter stacks cards you have in Fable Forest. Then we also have Fairy Assault. This is a nice addition to the Fairy Aggro deck that was established in BP06 Paragon of the Coliseum. This generates more fairies and does face damage equal to the number of Pixie Forest. You can tell this also includes Fairy Witch. So that's pretty nice with Forest. So overall we see in Forest Craft a lot of some cards that continue to push towards that control strategy a new type of control strategy involving filling up your EX area. You know, this could unironically go well with the Fable archetype. And Fairy Aggro gets one new card. Puppets remain stuck in their carpool, but apparently Puppets just remain too OP like they don't deserve any real support, right? Okay, moving on to Swordcraft. We start off with number seven, Ogawan the Chariot. This can come in to do one of three different things. It can summon a knight. It could come in as a 4-3 with Rush, or you pay an additional 4 on top of its casting cost of 3. You can then put it to Cemetery to choose a number 7 Old One Runaway Carrier from your Evolve deck. Put it onto the field. Now this card cannot in of itself attack period. But it does have funny RNG based abilities. So at the end of your turn, you roll a D6. If it's a 1 or a 2, it destroys all enemy followers. If you roll a 4 or a 5, it burns 7 to all enemy leaders, and you roll a 5 or 6, you take 7. So it is a high risk, high reward card. I would not be surprised if for some reason you just run into someone doing this at 
a carry man because as I say, fuck it, we ball. <laughs> so then we move on to more legit and big cards. Alyoska Warhawker, because you can't get Alyoska number one because Spark is already did that. Alyoska Warhawker summons an Ilmisunga Discord Hawker from deck. And he evolves for two to summon an Iriesta Weapons Hawker from deck and puts a two cost terminus weapon token to your EX area, which in of itself can destroy an enemy card, card, so that includes amulets on fanfare, and has lost words burn for while being like this big 6-6. Six, six. This is very much a threat. This does make mid range sword a little scarier than it already is. Moving on to Ilmasunga Discord Hawker. She can engage herself to deal 3 damage to an enemy follower or 5 if you control a merchant trait follower with a different name. So Alyoska, Ernesta, and Ilmasunga are all merchants along with Tycoon from BP09. And then we have Ernesta Weapons Hawker who does 2 burn damage if you control another merchant at the end phase. Very easy via Alyoska and company. And on Fanfare, she gives a younger Swordcraft follower plus one attack and a sail on Fanfare. So definitely no more need for Oathwish Knight if you still need that a sail and definitely no need for say Barbarossa, right? <laughs> Moving on to more Arcana cards, we have Prudent General. He comes in, spawns a Steel Clad Knight token. And while as long as he's on the board, he grants all your Swordcraft trade tokens rush. And he evolves to summon another Steel Clad Knight token and gives them all plus one plus one. So you can ha easily have a bunch of three threes with rush. That can just be Overwhelming on your point really quick, quickly, you know, again, mid range sword really, really eating well here. So now we move on to, yes, as I said, more Shadow vs. Flame support cards. Of course, with Swordcraft, we have more hero support. So we have Aerial Smash, it first does some damage to your board, and just does two damage to something on the board. And while it's in Cemetery, while you have five other heroic cards in Cemetery, you could pay one advantage itself to deal 3 face damage heroics are already like this aggro strategy as we have been seeing in the English game thus far. Area special is very very nice while being like relatively cheap. Now we have a very funny card that can really really get nasty on turn 6, Lightning Kicker. Fanfare discard 2 heroic cards from your hand to summon 2 heroic forests of different names that are cost 3 or lower. This card can also evolve for 2 to destroy an enemy forward of choice. So the combo obviously is to do something like reduce your hand size on purpose to summon Valiant Fencer and probably Mock Knight for the easy storm. And then use the Evolve 1 on Valiant Fencer while you have 2 or fewer cards in hand that Lightning Kicker hopefully enabled. And Evolve it and Lightning Kicker to do get both a 5-5 five five and Lightning Kicker to then destroy an enemy follower of your choice. That is quite insanity if doing it with Emerald wasn't plenty enough. Then we have Wing Slasher that can then look at the top 2 cards of your deck to put a heroic among them to your EX area. And it also has Rush as a 2-2, two -two, not too shabby for a 2-drop. Moving away from heroic back to more Arcana cards, we have Empress of Serenity. She generates 2 Shield Guardian tokens on play, 1-1 one -one wards. And she can also pay an additional 3 to give all followers with ward plus 1 plus 2. Not that shabby, you get two threes, you know, that basically makes them the equivalent of guard form golem in runecraft. And you play other wards before Serenity, even better, right? Then we move on to apparently a supposed Shadowverse Evolve exclusive, not even shown in the digital game nor the anime. We have Nelan Raging Knight, who gives all forwards with one attack aura. God, imagine a quick player with aura. And he can deal either 3 damage to an enemy follower or summon a cost 2 or lower fable follower from deck on fanfare. Which, those do exist. Kind of funny that fable source getting like this mysterious support. I, I suppose this helps with something like Maisie Red Riding Hood because I believe she has one attack. So not being able to target her could be handy, but because she engages to do her thing, it's kind of a whoop moment. Okay, now we have Honorable Thief, who is indirect usurpation support from BP05 Omen's Eternal because he mills two cards from your opponent's deck on Fanfare. If your opponent has 10 or more cards in your cemetery, he evolves automatically, otherwise he evolves for two. And as he evolves, he has the last words to draw a card. That's pretty good for usurpation, I gotta say. Then we have Selfless Noble, who destroys an enemy follower on Fanfare. And then he can discard your hand to draw 3 new cards. This was a little shaky. I don't really see control star being that much of a thing, but maybe stuff is over because it be indirect support for say Spartacus Shenanigans because he is going to cycle 
do your deck a little bit while also keeping your opponent at bay to prevent them from killing you before you wing off a spark. Because right, give me a pompous summons. It is a one cost spell. It either draws a card or while you control a princess, trade forward, tutor for any starcraft forward. So it's we basically boneless gem staff commander. All right, now we move on to runecraft. Runecraft we start with one of their token or of cards, number zero, then call the fool who. Looks at top 5, puts up to 2 Arcana cards among them to your hand. And you can evolve for 1 to give her the ability of each time you play an Arcana spell, which we do have a few, deal 3 damage to an enemy forest. So it's kind of like pseudo Agus Tech Young Away, where you do something to your opponent's board upon playing a spell. Now we have, of course, when calls associated spells, we have first Scourge of the Omniscient. It does Two burn damage to your leader to start with. Then it goes to EX area while you control number zero, then call the full. And it cannot be played from EX area, so think of it like Shadow's Corrosion from BP07 Virgin Steel. And at the end phase, as long as it's in EX area, it will burn your opponent for one. So your opponent will be on a clock one way or another. Pretty handy in quite the number of Runecraft decks. Spell Chain, Dirt. Well, maybe not Dirt. I think Dirt doesn't have spacing. But a hybrid dirt spell chain face deck perhaps. Give it a right of the ignorant. It heals you for two and then like Scourge of the Omniscient, it goes to your area while you control number zero then call the full. And again it cannot be played from your EX area. And at your end phase you draw one and discard one. So having that constantly you know that can definitely tick up your spell chain very very quickly, very very fast. Speaking of spell chain we have Rooney, Resolute Diviner, she has Fanfare at Spell Chain 5, deal 3 damage to an enemy 4. At Spell Chain 10, she burns 2 to your opponent and heals you for 2. And at Spell Chain 15, she can take every copy of herself from Cemetery, put it to your EX area. And at Spell Chain 20, she pumps herself and her copies in EX area by plus 2 plus 2. It's a lot of work for Spell Chain. These multiples of five, uh, in my opinion. I mean, like maybe comboing off with Daria Dimensional Witch could lead you somewhere, but I think. Playing Daria Dimensional Witch might be considered like too slow at that point in game. I guess it's probably a card that if any game brings back Daria Dimensional Witch into the fray if anyone wants to try it out. But I think it's overall the payoff isn't really there <laughs> despite being a legendary. Alright then we move on to Imperator of Magic who summons a cost 6 or lower golem trade forward from your deck. And he evolves for 1 to give that golem rush in a sale. Not too shabby, depending on the golem you're playing here. I think Victor Golem is a cost 6. It's been a hot minute. That might be something you could do. Having a rushing a sale has always helped in some situations. It's going to be quite the number of cards that just decide to refresh for no reason at the end of a turn. So whatever, right? And of course, just like with Heroic and the small bit of Beast Shenanigan support from Shadowverse Flame, we have none other. Then new chest support, we start off with checkmate. It does AOE damage to your opponent's board based on the number of chest cards in your cemetery. And while in cemetery, you can banish it to give a Mystic King Storm. So finally, chest has a real top end with checkmate. Then we have Gambit. It summons a magical pawn, gives a plus one attack and rush. And while you have five or more chest cards in cemetery, you can also summon a cost four or lower chest four from your deck, if I'm not mistaken. That's literally everything except Mystic King, so that is pretty handy. One card gives you two things, possibly more because we know that a lot of your chest followers just summon magical points for no real reason. Again, to top it off for chest, we have Skewer. It does one of the following reactions or two if you have five or more chest cards in Cemetery. Each player chooses a follower and puts it to Cemetery. You heal three or draw two cards. These are all pretty nice monsters. Are it's like boneless Dark Angel Olivia for chess. Okay, moving on. We of course have more support for Dirk. We have Juggling Mogi. It can either Fanfare four and Earthright to banish a cost four or lower enemy forward, and it can also evolve for one to summon a magic segment and add one to a stack that you control. This can get out of hand quite quickly. Juggling Mogi we know has also done this in a digital game for Dirk. So this definitely makes sense for the Evolve game as well. Then we have Potion Wizard. It draws a card on Fanfare and then it could evolve for 1 to give you your choice of opponent. It can, it can either discard a Runecraft card to heal 5. 
or discard a non-Runecraft card to deal 5 to an enemy follower. This card's a little iffy, I don't think there's enough. I don't think the incentives are really there to do that. I mean, like, yes, it enables spell chain a little more while healing up, but I guess it's kind of more for, say, a control-based strategy. Definitely something more for sure, I guess, if it is to be considered whatsoever. Then we have Creative Conjurer. It can either add one to a stack or Earthright to do Burn 2 on Fanfare. Again, this is additional utility, additional modularity in the already powerful dirt deck as of Booster Set 9, Duet of Light and Shadow. This could get nasty, definitely. Then we have Arcana, Artur. It either does draw one or it salvages a cost one spell from Cemetery. Not too shabby, but again, I don't know how many decks will really benefit from having a follower that does this simple cantrip at this point in the game. Then we have Magical Augmentation. It will either just normally do 2 damage to an enemy follower as a 1 cost spell, or it can Earthrite to deal 4 to that enemy follower and draws the card. So cantripping in the likes of Dirk, very powerful when, again, our two of our stars of Teachings of Creation or Witch's Cauldron slash Cauldron of Calamity does extend on fanfare. The, the resources keep on coming for Dirt. Okay, we are almost halfway there. We finally go into the Dragon Craft quest. We, have, of course, have Ix Arcana, number 11, Earns Justice. So, on fanfare. So, first of all, it, it's like it's like 8 cost, 8, 8 war. Not too shabby for what it is. And on Fanfare, it puts the cap card of your deck to your EX area. And if that card is a cost 5 or higher, it either evolves, because it cannot evolve normally, or it can go back to your hand, and if it left the field, it will also heal you for 8. And as an evolve, it comes in 11-11 with Storm that ignores Ward. So, King Elephant at home, am I right? Then we have Ayala, the Voltaic Knight. We don't have a yellow dragon sword, unfortunately, and he will either be an additional ramp at, of, as a 5 cost and recovers 2 play points, so it's kind of like a yellow dragon knight to some degree without the assail and without the last words and one less attack. Or at overflow, you can summon a 6-6 six, six devoted dragon token with ward, and that card cannot take damage from abilities as long as you control a yellow devoted knight. Again, more modularity to ramp based strategies and of course our verse flame support continues with none other than the armed archetype everyone is so excited for this one we have the dual mode for i can no longer call the guy mid to now the limiting dragon who went to the gym so it is a spell that is for an armed follower and let's just summon an armed follower for free and in your cemetery you can banish it to destroy one of your own levitating dragons and two draconic weapon tokens to summon an advanced follower with dual mode in its card game from your evolved deck. So you can choose from the following, and this time there is no weird. This card also counts as very tame dragon shenanigans. So we have Alpha, who has Rush and Strike, deal four to an enemy follower and heal yourself for two. And last words, he will bring back a Levitating Dragon from your cemetery in the engaged position. Beta has Ward, it does 2 AOE damage to your opponent's board and heals you for 4 while also having a once per turn activate. Pay 1, sacrifice a Draconic Weapon Token to draw 1 card and summon a cost 3 or lower armed forward from your hand. Pretty nice for board fill up. And of course we have the Chag Gamma mode where you get Storm but there are 5 more armed cards in your cemetery. And also has a once per turn activate of pay one and sacrifice a draconic weapon to also do two AOE damage while giving himself plus two plus two, which could be some nasty big storm damage. And again, it's generally speaking, by that point in Shadow vs. Evolve, most people are just paying off their play points, so they don't really have a quick to respond to this big storm damage energy. And continuing on with the arm support, we have Swift Blade Dragon Newt. It summons a Draconic Weapon and does 3 burn damage if you have 3 or more arm cards in Cemetery. And it can evolve for 1 to summon a cost 2 or lower arm forward from your deck and summons a Draconic Weapon. Really really getting that defense buff rolling rolling while also just doing chunks of damage to your opponent as armed. Like armed actually has hands now. Who will have dunk? Again we have Gallant Dragon Youth who acts an armed card from the top to, to your hand. 
and summons a Krakoe weapon and recovers one play point if you have three or more arm cards in Cemetery. Again, really incentivizing people to really go aggressive with the armed archetype to get these additional benefits. So yeah, armed, armed going to the darn gym. Then we have Slaughtering Dragon. This is a very funny card. It banishes top, the top five cards that are decked on Fanfare and it evolves for three to deal two AOE damage to your opponent's board and two damage to your opponent for every five cards that are banished. Combine that with Pike Dung, anyone? Okay, then we have Eternal Whale. He's a ward with last words, deal two damage to your opponent and put it either second from the top of your deck or second from the bottom of your deck. And if played from EX area, it recovers four play points. You can kind of combo it off with say, number 11 Ernst Justice to do some very hilarious stuff. Then we have Helio Dragon. Upon being discarded, it goes to your EX area. So kind of like Dragon Newt Fist slash Divine Tiger. And it also has a once per turn. When you discard a card, you heal three. Might be some revival to the Disco Dragon archetype for what it's worth. Then we have Dragon Cloud Lancer. It does two damage to an ally forward to give itself plus one, plus one, and rush. It's staying support. And also has an activate of three to get another plus one, plus one buff and a sail. Okay. A additional things to help this thing, I suppose. Now we have a very funny card, a Tropical Grouper. It's a ward that says that at your end phase, if you're controlling a Vogue follower, you add another copy of the guy to your hand from deck. It's okay. <laughs> it's a very weird way of cantripping. Again, we have Dragon Spawning. It puts a Dragoncraft follower from the top three cards of your deck to EX area, and it will cost you nothing if you are at overflow. So normally it costs two. Okay, we, we can do some EX area shenanigans in Dragoncraft to kind of keep the hand size up, right? Okay, Abyscraft time. We start with number 6, Milteo the Lovers. She has a fanfare of discarding a card to reveal cards at the top of your deck until you see two cost 3 or lower forwards that you can summon to the board and you shuffle the remainder of those cards to the bottom of your deck as opposed to choosing the order because heaven forbid you take yes time to deliberate the order on which cards go to the bottom of your deck. And then at the end of your turn, if you are at Necro Charge 20, she evolves. Again, she just like number 11 earns justice, she does not evolve normally. And at which point, she can pay an additional 2 upon evolving to destroy all your opponent's followers and change all of your opponent's leader's defenses to 6, just like in the digital game with the enhanced 9. So that can get really nasty if you do it right. Definitely gives some incentive for Necro Charge Turbo shenanigans. Then we move on to other shenanigans. We have number 14, Luzang Temperance. He reduces any damage you receive by 1, so Quick Blader can piece off. And he also prevents all enemy players from drawing outside of the start of their turn. And on fanfare, everyone, including yourself, discards cards from your hand until you have two remaining. Then he also has some associated cards to go with it, of course. We have Insatiable Desire. It burns you for two and draws two, so that's an easy sanguine enabler while also giving you a plus one. And while in Cemetery, and you control number 14, losing Temperance, you can banish it to deal 4 damage to an enemy forward and draw 1 card. Not that shabby. And then you have Unselfish Grace. It comes in with a number of Grace cards equal to the number of cards in your hand. So this is the thing I knew it. And you can either engage it and remove 2 Grace counters to heal 1. Or you can pay 1 play point, engage it, put it to Cemetery to Cougar for a cost 7 Arcana card, uh, number 14, losing Temperance just happens to be cost 7, so there you go. And of course we have to move on to more Shadowverse Flame support, this time for Ghosts. We have Sincere Soul, it first summons a Masquerade Ghost from your deck and gives it Ward, that's pretty convenient. And while well, it's in your cemetery, and you have a Masquerade Ghost in your ES area, again, as a last risk as it evolved, it goes to your EX area. You can pay for and banish it from your cemetery to summon a Masquerade Ghost Sincere from your Evolve deck against another advanced card. And a Masquerade Ghost Sincere has Storm to boot and gives a ghost, any ghost forward it comes down it will give it plus one attack and rush. And then it summons two Gargantuan Ghosts on Fanfare. And at last words, 
It summons a Masquerade Ghost from your EX area and engage it. Masquerade Ghost is apparently not dying. They have Spirit Cure right here. It can either put a Ghost token to your EX area or it could check your top three, grabbing a bit craft card among them, add to your hand and bomb deck and rest if you have a card with Ghost in its card name in your EX area. Then you also have Colossal Grudge. It could be played as a one play point if you have a card with Ghost in its card name in your EX area, reducing it to one from four. And then it does four damage to an enemy follower and two damage to its leader, so ghosts have hands apparently. Then we move on to Deathbringer. It has fanfare destroying enemy follower. You deal two damage to its leader and you heal two and you evolve one to do it one more time. Another one. Another one. Then we have Cross Devil Gimonium. Yup, Gimonium has grown up. He has Bane and Drain and on strike. He does AoE damage to your opponent based on his attack. And on Fanfare, if Sanguine is active for you, he gets plus one, plus one, rush and assail. Those are all beautiful keywords. The little guy definitely grew up. All right, a little bit more ghost support. We have Ghost we made. We have, she summons a ghost and on Evolve, she puts a ghost token to your EX area and Mills one is all right. Then we have Moonrise Werewolf. It evolves for one to deal three damage to an enemy follower if Sanguine is active for you. Well, it comes down a little earlier than your typical thing that would target something on the board, right? It's all right. Then we have more easy Sanguine neighbors in the form of Silver Boat Hunter. It does one damage to yourself on Fanfare and it has last words, above a guy up by plus one plus one. Just like in a digital game, not too shabby, or kind of like in a digital game. All right, now we have Soul Box. It's a rush with two fanfares. It destroys an enemy follower if a spell is in your cemetery, and it deals five damage to all enemy leaders if there is an amulet in your cemetery. That is, uh, that's a lot to uh, take in. I think it will only really be Necro Charge that will benefit best from this because I think they'll be the only ones who will play an amulet in Abyss. Well, if I guess if you play, say, Luzang, you will have and amulet in your cemetery. But yeah, all right. A bit of Bisscraft has additional control tools, new sanguine stuff, new ghost stuff. Good shit, good shit. All right, we want to Havencraft. Havencraft is starting with number eight, Sophina Strength. She has ward, and while she's on the board, she prevents all your followers from taking more than three damage at a time. So Conflagration has become downgraded to Dragon Wings. She can evolve for one and summon a Somnolent Strength from your deck, which is an, an amulet. On Fanfare, it gives up to two of your ally followers plus one plus one and it also has, it has an activate of one and gate to play to cemetery to reduce the attack of an enemy forward by two all right yeah that, that can get kind of nasty quickly all right then we have more arcana stuff for havencraft you have number 10 smash wheel of fortune you can fanfare pay two to summon a wheel of misfortune from your deck and anytime a card enters your ex area you can destroy an enemy forward and Wheel of Misfortune, it gets two disaster counters on Fanfare if you control number 10 slouch Wheel of Fortune and has the following two activate abilities. You can either engage it to add a disaster counter to it or engage in Poison Cemetery to destroy all enemy forests with the same cost as the number of disaster counters on the card. So you know your opponent plays a lot of a certain cost. You can just go ahead and stack the disaster counters accordingly and then broken stuff from there. Could be hanging some matchups. I think the ability to also just pop gains when gets with your EX area could be very very funny. For example, combined with something like Night's Way, right? All right, we have Reverend and Kigikager who have watched for one to put a forward with Ward from the top four to your EX area and reduce that card's cost by one until end of turn. Could be good for aggro, could be good for the actual mid-range Warhaven deck that gets introduced in Booster Site 6, Paragraphs of the Coliseum. Then we also have, speaking of aggro, so we have Tanzanite Convictor, which has Storm. She refreshes at your envis if her attack is 3 or more, so just buff her up with a being 2 old shrine, right? And she does 4 AoE damage on Fanfare if you control forward with 7 or more defense. Hello, Gary Diamond Master. And to continue on with the gemstone aggro thing, we have Topaz Sorgian. She's a ward that summons a being 2 old shrine from your deck on Fanfare. Well, that's convenient. You can also pay two on Fanfare to gain plus one plus three. And she can evolve for one to destroy an enemy four with three or less defense. Okay, yeah. Gem staff also got a bit of hands if you already have hands already. Moving on, we have Pure Song Priest. 
Here yeah, Iger has the fanfare of giving one of your own forest 4 defense and healing yourself for 4, or as a quick activate while he's in your hand, pay 1 and discard him to heal 2. You could get an additional activation of say, I think you could get an additional activation of say Elana's Prayer or Tenko Shrine on the opponent's turn, if you do it right. Then we have Priestess of Foresight, she's a ward that summons a cost 4 or lower or common 4 from your deck. Both number 8 Sophia Strength and number 10 Smash Wheel of Fortune are both 4 or under. Again, she can evolve for 1 and destroy up to 2 enemy forests, so Arcana Control Haven could be a thing, I suppose. Then we have Azurite Megan, she's a ward with fanfare. Pay 1 to return a Fae trait forward with ward from your cemetery to Eastern River and give it 1 attack. Okay, that, that might be handy, I suppose, on and off, I think. So I think a lot of cards fit that bill, if I'm not mistaken. Then we have Prisma Plume Berg. It has one of two fanfares. It summons a Holy Falcon for that easy storm damage, or it gets an amulet from your cemetery back into your hand. Not too shabby for a 4 drop if you feel the game's going slow enough, I suppose. Then we have Stall Warg Feather Folk. It is a warg. Nice 2 2 on a 1 drop. And also has an optional pay 2 on fanfare to give it. Plus one, plus one, and storm for a total of three. Get a three, three with ward and storm. And then you can buff it up with B2O Shrine if you already have it on board. Very, very handy. All right, then we have Holy Bright Altar. It summons a Holy Tiger on Fanfare, and that token will die at the end of the turn. And it also has an activate of pay three, engage and put it to cemetery to select one of your own followers, and you gain life equal to its cost. So probably nothing higher than obviously we can. But it could allow for the heal control deck to keep going. So what we got? We 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 got quite a number of shenanigans for a, a lot of healing going on. And gemstone has more hands. All right, we finally are going to wrap this up with our beautiful, beautiful new choice. We have none other than the cover card, the one, the only number twenty-one, Selgenea, the world. He is here. He has arrived. So he has two fanfares, he has fanfare, if you control no other followers, destroy one of your opponent's followers and draw one card, and fanfare. This is regardless if you meet the first condition. If your leader's defense is 10 or lower, you heal 5. And in Cemetery, you can pay 10, banish him to choose a number 21 Zelgenea, the ideal world, in your evolve deck, and put it to your EX area. And that guy, as you see here, he received a 10 drop, 10 10. While he's in your EX area at your end phase, it does 4 AoE damage to all your opponent's followers and 4 to the leader. And he also has fanfare. He will deal 10 AoE damage and 10 damage to your opponent. So you feel you play a bulky enough control strategy where you are healing enough, etc. And you feel confident that you will not die. You you could just tell your opponent, hey, you're gonna get crapped for 14 damage that you cannot really respond to. <laughs> that can be nasty. And of course, just having number one so in the world to equalize against aggro decks and so on. It's not too shabby. It's not as good as in the digital game where if you were at 14 life or lower, you would pop something big and draw 2 and heal 5. No, but it does make sure your opponent is not gonna go mega unga bunga unless they are confident that even if you do proc a turn 5 and return 1 soaking into the world, you will just end up dying eventually. Alright, now we have more funny neutral cards. We have Star Bright Deity. She is a ward with a fanfare of you reveal a card from your hand to search your deck for a card with the same name as the card you revealed, put it to your EX area. And she can evolve for 3 to banish a follower from your cemetery to search your deck for up to 2 followers with the same name as the banish card and put that to your EX area. Well guys, you can definitely abuse this in the likes of say Fable Burnhaven, right? Oh, 10 soldiers in my hand? No, okay, okay, we're just gonna put 10 soldiers straight to my EX area. Easy, easy, easy. Alright, then we have Fearon Haven Sank Wingog, who could be played as a 1 drop instead of her regular 4 if you're playing her from your EX area. She has fanfare, deal 4 damage to an enemy follower, and at the end of your turn, she gives 1 attack to all other ally followers. That is pretty nice. Then we have Falgan Shock, I believe this is another one of those cards that was only in the Shadowverse Flame anime, never made a digital game yet. It puts an angel follower from your cemetery and an enemy follower of your choice to EX area. 
Yeah, it could be something. It could be handy for Kuchoka to play enough angel cards, I suppose. Give me that one wing traitor with fanfare. Go get a card your deck, and if it's an angel or falling angel card, you add it to your hand. Bang, gets the boss for one. You give a ally angel or falling angel follower plus one plus one. We are definitely really making that angel falling angel deck work, huh? Then we have Mind Splitter with fanfare. It puts the top card of your deck to either you have four or more ally followers. Could be handy for aggro guests that are already trying to swarm the board as it is. Continuing on with the angel game, we have Angelic Strike. It destroys two enemy followers, and if you have a falling angel card ear cemetery, it also heals you for two. As a six drop, at only sorcery speed, it might be a little too slow, but you really need to take out two big guys or something. It is there, I suppose, and it could be grabbed off of one wing trainer, I guess. Then we have Pure Shock Angel with Fanfare, deal three damage to an enemy follower, and she could evolve for one to deal three damage to an enemy follower and its leader. So this could be another way to just do some incremental phase damage if you have the space for both that and the evolve. Again, the number's a little awkward with it being a five drop. Then we have Corruption Guardian. It's a ward with fanfare, discard a angel or falling angel card to heal three, draw one, and recover two play points. That ain't too shabby. And then we have Wing Courier with a simple strike, draw one card. So that's been as quick of a run as possible as I could give for Booster Set 10, Gods of the Arcana. Are you looking forward to the set? What are you most excited about? And continue to embrace the darkness and we'll catch you all over in the next video. Bye bye.